Hey folks, welcome back to World War II TV, and this is a roundtable about the impact of the Tunisian campaign. Now, I could list my guests' qualifications, accolades and books, uh, etc., but it would take about 20 minutes, so all I'm going to say is they all bring a certain amount of expertise in different areas to discuss discussion, and particularly we're talking about the impact on the wider war. Over the course of this series, we've looked at the sort of training, the, uh, the development of doctrine and tactics, and that will be something that I'm sure will come up, but there's also this wider impact globally. So I'm going to bring my guest in, and uh, so no big long introductions, but hello, panel. How are you today? Hey, Paul. Hey, Paul. So good. So, you know, the the over as I said in in the introduction there, the, the, we've talked a lot about the actual sort of strategic aims, the tactical improvements, but we haven't talked about the kind of the particularly the impact of the, the various countries as they move out of the Tunisia campaign elsewhere. So I'm going to bring Karine first because her expertise particularly is France and Italy. So um, we're going to bring our first question up on screen, uh, which and this is what we're going through, folks. So what were the strategic impacts of Tunisia or the Tunisia campaign for France, Germany, Italy? So we'll bring Richard and Sam and Kevin in for Germany. But Karine, we'll bring you in first as you, the new, new person into the panel here. To, to start by saying it's complicated is, is a fair assessment. But, but fr do you want to tackle France first or Italy? Which would you prefer? Well, I think I'd like to answer that Firstly, from a kind of Vichy French perspective, but also bringing in Italy, because this whole question of Tunisia has been quite a problematic one for, for quite some time before um, Torch um, happens, because, I mean, the Vichy government, of course, you know, comes in in um, July 1940 after the armistice and theoretically declares itself neutral but of course it quickly starts collaborating with the Axis but it's primarily collaborating with the Germans because with the Italians things are a little bit more difficult because the Italians of course see places like Tunisia as one of their areas that for ideological reasons and for all sorts of other reasons that you know this is an area to which they aspire and but of course it's a French Protectorate. So this is an area of tension and had been even before um, the rise of Mussolini and the fascists. So Tunisia is, is already a kind of problem between France and Italy, between Vichy, France and Italy. And already in late 1941, early 1942, it really came to a head because the Italians were desperate for access to the Tunisian ports and the the Vichy French government used this to try and bargain between the Germans and the Italians to play them off against one another because the, the, uh, the Italians in particular were so desperate um, to get supplies to Libya and using the Tunisian ports, of course, meant that they cut the amount of time that was being spent transporting um, material equipment, um, arms and so on across the sea and then they could transfer it across the land. So, so the Vichy French government tried to use this as a sort of bargaining tool and they used it to, to play the Germans and Italians off against one another. So it's, it had already been an issue before that. But when the torch landings happen, of course, theoretically the, the position of, of Vichy was that they were supposed to, they'd always said that they were neutral, they would defend against everyone, whether the, it was the axis that um, uh, encroached on French sovereignty there or whether it was the Allies. In the end, of course, the, the Vichy government decided very quickly um, within hours to allow the Germans and the Italians into Tunisia to send their troops in. And because it was the Allies that arrived, they saw them as the... as In North Africa, they saw the Allies as the aggressors. So they immediately sort of showed themselves to be very much siding with the Axis rather than the Allies. So this is when the, the kind of point of, of the Vichy claim to be neutral really sort of showed itself to be nonsense, effectively. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. So I think I'll bring Richard in to respond to this and then Sam a bit, because Richard, you've written a lot about the, you know, the logistics, of the Mediterranean campaign and, it, and it, you know, Italy is an area you've studied as well. 
it, it to say it again, I'll, I'll repeat myself. It is a bit complicated that situation. We talked with Vincent O'Hara at the beginning of the week. You know, the the, the, the torch landings. They're attacking ports without really knowing what the French reaction is going to be militarily. The navy ends up being the the, the most stubborn in men. some ways. Some garrisons defend to the last man almost some just give up immediately it's very different difficult to kind of to, to predict that but but after the Tunisian campaign um would you want to give us an assessment of where we are in terms of how the Mediterranean is sitting what's it looking like what are the allies aspirations what are the axis aspirations then we'll bring Sam in to kind of answer the same question but Richard uh to kind of feed off what Karine said there um without without touching too much on the relationships which I maybe we'll talk later I guess for me the Tunisian campaign and that, that period, because there's a lot of other concurrent things that are happening, is very much the sign from the Italian perspective. It's the sign that what the, the period known as the fascist war from 40 to 43 is coming to an end. Um, it's one of many sort of things around that time in, in 42, 43, that is an ongoing issue of um, Italy has to fight, and Germany also, of course, fights to, to a substantial extent in the Mediterranean, but it's not their main theatre in the way that it is for, for Italy. Um, it's an ongoing process of having to try and fight this war from the Italian perspective that they're, they're not prepared for. Arguably, no one's prepared for what happens in the Second World War, but from the Italian perspective, the only war you could really fight was a short one, and they're now a couple of years into it. Um, and they're having to fight with quite limited resources, particularly construction materials, things like this. They've had armed forces they thought wouldn't be prepared to even start a war until 42, 43. And by the time of the culmination of the Tunisian campaign, you have the best remaining, or many of the best remaining units of the Italian army are captured in Tunisia because they, they can't be evacuated. Uh, concurrently with what's happening with the Italian army in Russia, it's happening at the same time. Uh, the Italian Navy is effectively spent over supplying um, Tunisia over what are known as uh, the route of death. Uh, the Italian Air Force is diminished to the point of, of, of being really quite a small service by the end of the Tunisian campaign. So for them, it's a sign, I think, that the fascist war is, is not going to be sustainable. This is something they've worried about before Torch. One of the biggest pre-Torch Italian high-level conferences in the start of October 1942, they're saying all the same stuff. So it's not like a big turning point, it's just an acceleration mm. of a process for them. I think for the, the German perspective, not only is this a deterioration of the Italo-German relationship, which maybe we can talk about more a bit later, yeah. it's also a sign, even though with the partial exception of some in the German Navy, they see the Mediterranean area as peripheral, they're going to have to fight there more and they don't want to. Um, so it's a kind of a really serious set of problems from the Axis side, whereas from the Allied side, it's, it's more about dealing with the new situation that you've created, which has many possible positive aspects, but is going to create a lot of arguments about the best thing to do. Well, I think I'll bring Kevin in now. And, and what you said there, Richard, very personal, because and for, we'll bring Sam in as well, is that the European players are also, to some extent, thinking about a post-war um, situation as well as just this immediate fighting of the war. Whereas you, Kevin, well, you can unmute yourself. Kevin, the US, you're not, you're the resident Yankee, you didn't really have a dog in the fight in that area of the world before the war, and you don't really care particularly about what's happening afterwards. So when the US look at the Tunisian campaign, someone like yourself, a historian, do you think you're more looking at it solely from the military point of view? What have we learned of how to wage war? And all this relationship between Italy and France, so is that secondary for pe people like yourself, or do you find it fascinating as well? Um, I find it very confusing, as did the Allied commanders. Uh, Eisenhower gets a real lesson in European politics once the fighting is over, because he has to kind of pick who the uh, French leader is going to be that the Allies are going to deal with. And he picks Admiral Dorlam, mostly because the Navy had fought so well against the Allies. And he thinks, you know, this guy can be reasoned with, um, but he's Vichy. And so many people in England uh, are furious about this and France. Um, and, you know, he's really concerned. Like, did I make a mistake? I, I think I did the right thing. And State Department people are angry. But the American people, 
don't understand any of this and it has no impact back home. And it, it's almost interesting to me how this is such a political balancing act. Yet by the time you get to 44, it's so irrelevant. Nobody cares about, you know, a French communist, a French freedom fighters, as long as they're resistance and they're fighting the Germans, that's all the Americans care about. And so it's something that Eisenhower is walking on eggshells about early in the war. And it's such a, a something that's just overcome by events. So that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, it also exposes the Vichy French for their, not just their um, agreement with Adolf Hitler's Germany, but adherence to German laws. Uh, the Allies are going to see the Jewish people in Morocco are wearing, uh, you know, the gold, uh, you know, the stars of David. And I hate to say this, but it expe exposes George S. Patton because State Department guys go to him and say, OK, we're in charge now. We need to get rid of all these anti-Semitic laws. And Patton's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, we want the French to police Morocco so we can fight. I'm not going to take these anti-Semitic laws off the books. And it's a great shock to a lot of people. Like, wait a second. This is what we're supposed to be fighting against. And you're saying it's OK to, to incorporate it or to, to let it survive. So, um, you know, a, a big school for the Americans, and it also exposes the American, uh, some Americans for their feelings. Okay, so before I turn to Sam, Kevin, you know, that question up there, what were the strategic impacts for, of Tunisia for France, Germany, Italy, anything you want to add specifically to that, and particularly an American point of view, because you come from the school of studying your Martin Blumensons and the Carlo Destes, the kind of people that you as an American grew up with, well, I, I did as well, but uh, anything that you think your American slant on this is going to be different to the other, the other panelists here before we move on to Sam's, Sam's version? Just and, and I hate to sound super American about this, but it's like you are super American. That's why you're here. <laughs> America's here. America has got boots on the ground. We're, you know, we, we can start to see the end of the war because we are here. Um, you know, Germany, Italy, beware. Uh, but Germany, and Italy do not feel that way about the American army. They feel mm. that they're coming in at the end of a campaign. These Americans, you know, we gave them a punch in the nose and they bled out. Uh, if it wasn't for their control of the Mediterranean, we probably could have won this. So um, the, the, the access powers are not impressed. I'll just right. say yet. OK, so, Sam, we'll bring you in. You've been patiently sitting there waiting there to, to have your opinion. So the, the strategic impacts, anything different to others that, that you, you want to say or, or do you agree with Richard or anybody? So uh, give us your opinion. So I think one of the sort of things that we can touch on there with terms of strategic impacts for France, Germany, particularly Italy, is that we often speak of Britain as being the unsinkable aircraft carrier. Um, Tunisia is the southern front's unsinkable aircraft carrier. It yeah. has developed airfields and it's almost unreachable because the Allies now control the Mediterranean. And what you're going to see thereafter is, me is Mediterranean Air Command going and sitting as many flying fortresses and other heavy bombers there as they can and wreaking absolute havoc on what is left mm. of um, Italy's fairly artisanal military industry and striking in, up from the south, um, giving them another vector of attack on, on German industry as well. And that um, impact is quite powerful, but it also... Um, France, in terms of as a polity, um, the Vichy French cease to exist, um, effectively. You move from, and I know we're touching on the relationships that we're going to mention later, we move from being cooperators to collaborators at this point. Whatever left of the French state is working with the Germans, um, or, or rather for the Germans, rather than with. Um, and this entire sort of southern front, I know that it's an oft repeated refrain of the soft underbelly and such. What it, regardless of how difficult it actually was to crack, what it forces is Germany and Italy to devote even more resources to thousands of miles of coastline. Mm. And this is uh, a further stretch on top of losing. Uh, roughly 320,000 men, include, once you've included the captured, the killed and the wounded from Tunisia, um, vast swaths of material. Um, the, the Luftwaffe, uh, I think, Richard, you mentioned this, the, the, the German Navy um, and the Italian Navy particularly get damaged horrendously, but the Luftwaffe also, I believe it commits a fifth of its strength to the Mediterranean 
but is also having to commit 40% of its production, so double its commitment um, in order to maintain its air strengths. And even then, it's getting slaughtered. Uh, the German air transport fleet gets massacred just mm. at the uh, time that they're actually needing it on the Eastern Front. Um, fundamentally, the material damage of Tunisia is quite staggering. And in terms of land forces, we mentioned manpower, the Tunisian campaign, as opposed to some of the other fronts, is very material mecha mechanized intensive. A lot of the German units there, a lot of the Italian units there are quite well equipped with armor and, and, and artillery. Um, and all of that is savaged. It's savaged on the route to Tunisia. It's savaged in Tunisia. It's savaged on the dock side. And this just it, it's it's one of the the beginnings of, uh, beginning peals of the death knell for German military and uh, well particularly Italian military industry at this point because it just cannot keep up with hemorrhaging that sort of um, that sort of level of supply at the same time it's hemorrhaging manpower on the Eastern Front mm. um, and uh, another military another strategic impact but positive for France if you're viewing it from the Allied side of things is that France is now back. It, it's got, it's, you know, the, the French Committee of National Liberation is set up um, with Giraud and de Gaulle. And you also have the formation of French Corps in, in Tunisia. You have the 19th Corps form um, and a commitment by Eisenhower for a rearmament program, I think, eight infantry and three armored divisions. And this flow of, of manpower and material, um, you know, you're combining that French exile manpower with with US material primarily, gives the Allies yet another stream to, to tap into, yeah, to, good point. to throw at the axis. Brilliant. I'm, I'm, Bridget, do you want to say something? Just sort of, if, if that's okay, picking up quickly on, on Sam's point, if we're going to talk about flows of, of material, which is something that always interests me, um, the end of the Tunisian campaign results inevitably in a, a tightening of the blockade on the European Axis powers. I mean, in reality, Italy yeah. is going to be signing an armistice relatively soon. But for Germany, as of 1939, where you've got a non-belligerent Italy in the Mediterranean, you can, to some extent, there's only a partial blockade in place. They can try and use a semi-neutral Italy as a, a kind of a, an extra sort of secret route of supplies mm. through the south. When Italy declares war, there's a much harder blockade from Gibraltar and Suez, but they can still try and get some things like um, the Vichy French, as they then, then become, do bring some things in through them with, for them with neutral shipping. They can maybe try and lean on the Spanish. Those things go, after, particularly after the Tunisian campaign. Obviously, the French option is, is gone. There's a much tighter blockade in general because they have removed the contesting southern shore of the Mediterranean. And then also on top of that, the Americans, Kevin talked a lot about American involvement. One really interesting chapter is right around this sort of time, a bit earlier starting it, the, the Americans leverage really heavy economic pressure on Spain, who are really dependent on uh, the US for certain things, particularly oil. Um, and they, they just didn't threaten to deny them to Spain to stop them supplying these things on to germany so it's the timing of, of the blockade right we okay yeah. the axis powers are three major powers that are all desperately searching for a short war they can win decisively and they're losing a, a long war where there is no decisive thing happening so it's all just a an ongoing increase yeah. of the pressure well thanks very much for that guys and i think we end up coming back and referencing the the implications of the campaign as we go through the other questions but the, the, the one we're going to bring up now and i'm going to turn to karine first is how did torch and tunisia affect into ally relationships now the obvious big one there that's come up over these two weeks is the usa and and, and britain and there had been some you know low points about how they were going to you know who to what to do with the planning and the french involvement there's been some, and there's been some kind of high points and and there's and eventually this leads to the mostly harmonious relationship you get by 44 in Operation Overlaw. But there are some definite low points in the Tunisian campaign. But I want to bring Karine in first, because one of the things when we talk with Michael, we'll talk with Michael Nyberg on Thursday is, is predicting what the various French factions, the admirals, the politicians were going to do pre-torch was, was almost impossible. But after torch, after the campaign, everybody who is 
French has had to kind of admit who they are. They've got to put their loyalty somewhere. They've got to come out and say what they are for, what they're against, what they what they what they want to do. So it starts to become clearer for the allies to kind of work out who it who there is there and who they can work with. So Kareen, take us through what, what happens with France post Tunisia and Vichy and 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 who the who the who the who the perhaps the main players that come out of this campaign and how the Tunisian campaign influenced how they were going to be involved later if, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I mean, again, a, a complicated picture. I mean, the, the Americans, of course, had really, you know, throughout this period leading up to Torch and had really pinned their hopes actually on being able to persuade elements, at least, of Vichy to perhaps change sides. And they had been looking at people like General Vegar, who was um, positioned um in North Africa, they thought that maybe he could be persuaded um, to support them. That I mean, General Vegan was was one of the people who had been very much in favour of um, the armistice in, in June 1940. But although he had supported collaboration, he was never, you know, he was never sort of pro-German, and he really did, resented the um, every time the Germans and the Italians encroached on French sovereignty in North Africa. He really sort of grumbled about that. So the Americans were sort of hoping that he might come on side. They, of course, maintained diplomatic links with the Rishi government, which is a different policy, of course, to the British, who, you know, from the start had supported de Gaulle and, and really kind of, you know, him as the, the future of France. And, and of course, this is another moment when the all of this kind of comes to the surface. And of course, what creates a real problem, which nobody really anticipated, was the fact that Admiral Dallon happened to be in um, North Africa at the time that, that uh, the torch landings. He happened, his son happened to be ill. He was visiting yeah. him um, in Algeria. And so Admiral Dallon had, had been, you know, a leading figure in the Vichy government. He had been one of the people who had really um, advanced collaboration um, in 1941. He, um, 1942, before Laval came back, um, he was really sort of um, a, a kind of anglophobic figure, um, but you know, very senior figure, somebody who was considered to have a lot of respect. And so, what the Americans did, and what Eisenhower did, was to to make this agreement with Dallon. The the, the point was that Dallon would then bring on side the, the Vichy forces in North Africa, but also the, the French fleet, or what was left of it in Toulon. Um, and of course, as we've heard already mentioned, the, this, this deal goes down really badly um, with American and British public opinion because it goes totally against what everybody thought the Allies were supposed to be doing because Darlan comes in and um, although he you know, sort of distances himself from Vichy, he, he still, you know, and, and many of the senior military figures um, in North Africa still retain their loyalty to Peta. So although they're sort of um, now separate and, and the Vichy government kind of repudiates them, they are still effectively running a, a kind of Vichy administration in North Africa. And this causes all sorts of problems. And of course, de Gaulle, meanwhile, you know, hadn't been told even that the torch landings were going to happen. He was kept completely out of all of this. Um, there had been tensions with, between de Gaulle and, and the British for some time over various things, um, perhaps most recently over Madagascar, where, again, the British had gone in and, and not told uh, de Gaulle and the Free French what they were doing. Um, so, you know, de Gaulle is, is really quite angry when he discovers what's happened. And then, of course, when he discovers that the deal with Dallon, but what actually happens once of this is, is that it tips the balance, in the political balance in favor of de Gaulle because, because there is such a, a backlash against the, the Dallon deal um, uh, in public opinion. Now, the other figure of course is General Giraud, yeah. um, who had escaped um, from captivity. Um, and he was the other one, he was the one the Americans originally had hoped to put in place uh, before they discovered that Dallon was there. 
Um, and he again was was somebody that they thought was more trustworthy than de Gaulle. They thought that de Gaulle was just sort of a, a dictator in waiting. They thought that Giraud could be more trusted. Um, but Giraud as well is, is a little bit of a, a sort of complicated figure because although he doesn't support Vichy, a sort of reactionary figure, and he also, um, you know, when, when Darlan is assassinated and, and Giraud takes over, he, he essentially carries on with what Vichy policies um, were already in place in North Africa. Um, so there is that division and and that division really kind of plays out um, between the British and the Americans over what exactly you know, their ideas are for the future of France and who they're backing, because they're, they're, there really is no agreement between them. No, and it's worth pointing, of course, that, you know, Kevin, you said that the reaction in the US about, you know, they don't, you know, US don't even, most civilians don't even understand the politics and the backstory of and fishy and front. It's just, it's a landing where we're, we're going to start killing Germans. It's kind of the simplistic way Americans and British maybe a similar way. But, but when, if we were to ask the question about what did France think about Operation Tort, well, what do we mean by France? We mean domestic France, Vichy France, uh, occupied France? Do we mean the colonies? Not, you know, which, which part of the colonies? You know, as Michael Nyberg writes in his book, I mean, within, within even a city as uh, like Casablanca, you've got people who don't like the British, but but, but want, like the Americans, people who don't like the Americans, but kind of like the British people are kind of pro uh, 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 Arab, uh, Arab freedom over the... There's a whole lot of people with different ideas of what they want now and what they want in the future as well. So there isn't, I guess, a single French reaction to Operation Torch. It depends where you are, depends who you talk to, depends what your politics are. But is that, as someone who studies this, Karine, is this the high water mark of the complication of France, or does it get and it gets easier by 44, 45, or is it 1940 to me seems a little bit simpler, but is this is this the is this the most complicated part of France's World War II? Mm, uh, yeah, it, it's difficult really because there are there are so many uh, times, but I think this is the moment, I guess, when these these divisions really do come to the surface and as you say yeah. you know this is the moment where people are having to really define their position and and you know perhaps you know de gaulle had been in london doing his thing and vichy had, had been sort of carrying on um and you know all these different factions hadn't perhaps had to encounter one another and hadn't been confronted you know as i said this is the first time that rishi's actually you know, in this position where it's really having to make those decisions, this direct decision between the Allies and the Axis, it hasn't, you know, really been in that position before. So, so yeah, I mean, this, this all of this comes to the surface, and I think, you know, this is a time when all of that, all of these um, attempts, at, you know, all these sort of uh, complexities perhaps become a bit clearer as I said you know Rishi trying to 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 play different sides and you know that the, there were still those myths and ideas that um you know that perhaps Peter was playing a double game that who was secretly on the the side of the the allies all along and and of course all that's exposed to to not be true um, mm. um so so yes yeah, so I think when things start to become Clearer, and I think Vichy really exposes itself to be very much on the side of collaboration, and and I think this is also, you know, real beginning of that turning point in French public opinion in in you know mainland France when people really see that that the Vichy government is not, you know, protecting their best interests. No, definitely. Effectively. So let's put the question up on screen again, Kevin. So so I'm going to bring you in, Kevin, because again, our resident and only American there, you know, you, you obviously want to bring in the, the US and, and, and Great Britain's uh, relationship there. And, you know, if you want to summarize kind of where it was before Torch and where it was after Tunisian campaign, please, please do so. Then I'll bring Sam and Richard in. So how does the relationship progress Britain and USA through this, to this, this six month or so campaign? I think uh, the feeling, and, I, and the guys can probably speak better to, to, the, to this than I can, but I think the feeling with the British was great relief. That, you know, finally, America is in the war. We have divisions fighting the, the Axis powers. Um, so there's a better feeling there. I think they look at Eisenhower. They're grateful for the troops. They're grateful for the equipment. They just don't think American leadership is up to snuff, and the Americans are going to kind of prove that uh, at Kazarine Pass. 
uh, and kind of, you know, make real all of the anxieties the British have of American leadership. Um, you know, who's this guy Eisenhower? He's a staff officer that's suddenly been put in command. And, you know, if we can just kind of keep him at the Rock of Gibraltar while we manage this war, everything will be fine. So, you know, uh, initially gratitude for the, the troops and the equipment, but not buying American leadership just yet. And this is sort of a side note. Of course, I'm going to mention the patent stuff because that's what I've been researching for 20 years. Um, but it's important in the British-American relationships because he is a major commander. So is, uh, uh, at the time, General Montgomery. And um, after the, as Montgomery's pushing uh, the access, what is it, 15th Army, sort of north, he does a pause and he puts together sort of an after-action university, you know, and has different classes to figure out what went wrong and what went right and how better to fight the Germans and, the, and I guess the Italians at this point. And he invites uh, some Americans, and the only people that show up are Patton and Beadle Smith, Eisenhower's chief of staff. And uh, it's very famously known that Montgomery does not allow smoking in his presence or in his headquarters, wherever that might be. And uh, Montgomery's giving a talk, and Patton and, and Smith are listening to it, and Patton starts chafing and, and jonesing for a cigarette. So he opens his cigarette case, he's tapping a cigarette on his knee, and Beetle Smith kind of elbows him. He's like, George, what are you thinking? You know, you can't do this. Of course, he doesn't really say that. He just kind of gives him a look. And Patton puts the cigarette away. Um, and then later at lunch, Patton has lunch with General Lease or Lee Say. And Lee Say, and, he, and the, the British general says to Patton, you know, what did you think of the fact that you couldn't smoke, you know, during Montgomery's talk? And he says, well, you know, I might be old and stupid, but I'm no, but it didn't mean anything. And, you know, it's not a big deal. Well, the British start spreading this story around. And by the time it gets to Montgomery, what people, you know, they game telephone that is as it goes kind of around the circle, it gets warped. So by the time it gets to Montgomery, the story is that uh, Lee said to Patton, what did you think of Montgomery's speech? And Patton says, well, I might be old, blind and stupid, but it didn't mean a thing. Like it, it mm. I'm impressed. And so that really kind of insults Montgomery. And it's a shame because it's it's not on purpose or anything. It's a miscommunication. And there's going to be, I'll just say, a touch of friction between Montgomery and Patton as the war goes on. It's, it's the first round of a multi-round <laughs> next two years of, 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 of ongoing things. But, you know, but it, you know the, we've been talking all, all these two weeks. So, you know, Paul Sparrow, we are at his heart. We're lucky that FDR and Churchill got on. They had often yes. very different... Um, hopes post-war, different different ways of wanting to wage the war immediately, but they could communicate, they could talk, they could exchange ideas, and they worked through what was quite a quite a problem period for them, you know, and 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 come out of it despite their differences of how they think the war should be weighed. They're probably as stronger than ever at the end of the torch campaign. I and I, I kind of would like to think that that relationship at the top filtered down through some of the allied commanders due to them you know if if fdr and church can get on then hell we can put aside any difficulties you've got but I, but i'm waiting for sam or, or, or richard to kind of say no no that's not true there but kevin before i move on for you any, anyone you think you want to say given about that yeah i just want to say americans unfortunately love to focus on montgomery and and any of his faults and his stubbornness when there were so many british officers that worked so well with the Americans. Everyone on Eisenhower's staff was impressed with Eisenhower as a decision maker, as a leader. Um, there were several, you know, British generals that Patton did get along with. So we we tend to, at least on this side of the Atlantic, focus on the Montgomery relationship. And it's a shame because there were so many positive, well-working relationships between the British and the Americans all over the globe. Well, I'll bring Sam and Richard on because that you're definitely right. I think because basically books sell about arguments better yep. than they sell about people getting on and 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 being being supportive of each other. So you know the the, the pattern movie that's come up several times. I mean the Montgomery uh, pattern relationship is 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 highlighted as as being problematic all through that movie there. But let's bring Richard in. Well, let's bring Sam in first this time. So inter allied relationships. Feel free to bring in whoever you want in there. U.S., U.K., France, whatever. Just. Your assessment of how the Tunisian campaign leaves those relationships. So I think that it's, I, I find it fascinating that um, Kevin says that the Americans focus a lot on Montgomery because what I've found looking at how 
British sources tend to treat the Tunisian campaign, they spend a lot of time on Montgomery as well. Mm. And um, like you said, one of the most fascinating um, things is actually that the Tunisian campaign, and I'd argue more so than later campaigns, is where the inter-allied or rather the Anglo-American relationship is at some of its strongest. Um, Eisenhower does get quite a bit of flack for being a desk general to start with, but I, I think by the end, almost it, it's you know fairly standard practice to say everybody likes Ike, um, mm. because it, and while uh, at certain points Patton curses him out for saying that he's in the uh, the British's back pocket for um, British commanders to to say that he's favouring the Americans. Ultimately, it's that that whole thing of if you're trying to be impartial, you'll please no one. Yeah. Um, but Ike's power of charisma is very strong, and he's also assisted quite ably. And this is where there is a bit of conspiracy theorizing around the Allied command structures. Um, when the Allied Force HQ then gets Mediterranean Air Command, 18th Army Group, and the uh, Mediterranean Fleet, or you know, Allied Naval Forces in the Mediterranean, sort of brought together, um, each of them is led by a by a British officer. Um, because you've got Tedder, you've got Alexander, and you've got Cunningham. Um, and all of them are exceedingly experienced officers, but it does lead some to assess it as, well, we've kicked Ike upstairs to let the British run the campaign. And that's somewhat unfair, um, because fundamentally, Ike is running the campaign very well. Um, he has to deal a lot of the time, particularly in December. He's got Marshall ringing him every day going, uh, are you paying attention to Spanish Morocco? Um, when he's trying to look at the front line and deal with um, the fact that, that there is mud about three feet deep there. There's one train line to the front and his troops are holding a, a battalion for every five or six miles. Um, and he's dealing with both of those problems. And I think that one of the things when we focus on Montgomery, for instance, is that we have this tendency to to look purely at the big personalities. Um, and actually what's lost a lot in the noise is people like Anderson, who mm. is very unfairly maligned from this campaign. Because again, we look at the accounts that we prioritize and the big accounts that we prioritize are Bradley, Monty, um, to some extent, uh, Bedell Smith, Alexander, um, Patton. And all of them don't particularly have very good things to say about Anderson. And he doesn't have an account of his own because you have that sort of battle of the books after the end of the, mm. of the Second mm. World War, where every general is writing their memoirs. And Anderson's a quiet man. He's known as like a dour Scotsman. And he doesn't write a memoir. So he doesn't get his end held up. And what you get from Tunisia is this incomplete picture of a bunch of people who for the Americans, for instance, they rotate command of Second Corps quite a bit. So you have Fredendall, who then gets disgraced and chucked out um, and does lead to that unfair malignment of American troops, predominantly because of his shoddy leadership, um, even though some of his subordinates lead brilliantly during Kasserine. Um, and what you you end up with is this distorted picture of it's either eight, eighth army show and the desert rats beat out British first army every time or second corps are being held back by these mean senior officers. Um, but if we sort of shift from personality for a second, what we actually get out of Tunisia is the strongest structure of an allied operational command that is going to last the rest of the war. Um, and, I'll dwell on that quite a bit because I uh, it, that that's what I I worked on. That's but been your AF thing for the last few years, yeah. Exactly, AFHQ and Mediterranean Air Command and all of these other things like base sections within the logistical system are going to define how the Allies prosecute war for the rest of the Second World War. And to an extent, it filters into the other theatres as well. It shows up in North, in um, in Overlord and into Northwest Europe. It's there for the rest of the Italian campaign. The Allies have figured out how they're going to fight below the strategic level. And that's one of the most important outcomes um, mm. of the campaign. And it's only through suffering their way through Tunisia, because they'd hoped that they could do it in a couple of weeks, and it's the six months of fighting that they go, maybe we need to figure out how to do this better. 
be, because they either try to be too distant from each other, so not prosecute the war except on a strategic level, and that doesn't work. I think ABDA, the um, American, British, Dutch, Australian command in um, the Pacific theater collapses purely because of that. They try and keep everything separate and it ends up commanding nobody effectively. And then they try in Tunisia to bring it too close together and mesh units down to the battalion level. And that goes disastrously because mm. you've got 20 years of prevailing military knowledge and tradition um, from the First World War built up. And American troops don't fight the way that British troops do, who don't fight the way that French troops do. And so what they figure out is where they need to draw that demarcating line and where they need to cooperate. So um, Richard will know about the, the, the logistic structure, for instance, is um, is brilliant um, and is predominantly the Americans deal with their stuff, the British deal with their stuff, and they unite it at only the topmost level so that they can... Um, they can coordinate movement of supplies and things, but otherwise, other than that, you don't you don't send grand ammo to a British unit, and you don't send Enfield rounds to an American unit. Okay, good stuff. Let's, well, let's bring Richard in now, and we'll put the screen the question up on screen again. So, inter-allied relationships, because I think when people saw that question, they are thinking about, in some ways, the interpersonal relationships. Yeah, you know, the, the the Montes and the and the patterns, the FDRs, and the Jobs. But of course, it's about the relationships. And and connections between between doctrines, between way methods of waging war, because they come into this with every everybody with a slightly different um, idea about how to wage the war in the Mediterranean theatre generally. So, Richard, how would you assess the the the, the relationships and and, def and use the word relationship to, to mean whatever it was you, you, you want to talk about? Really, I wondered if I'd, I'd start by picking up on Sam's point about in some ways is this actually really good and things get worse, or is it? Is it bad and things get better? I, I wonder if this is a point about the level at which we look at the, at the war. So Sam made a lot of really excellent points about mm. how there are issues at the operation, what we, what we would now call the operational level, where they try and integrate down to battalion level and they don't work together very well. Neil Barr's been good on this, and then I'm sure soon we'll be able to read from Sam about it. Um, and they, they, there's a kind of a learning process there for improving things. However, this is crucial because Tunisia is that kind of learning campaign where they bring together all these crucial structures for operating war, conducting war at what we would call an operational level now. What's going to come during the Tunisian came, campaign, but after it, is a, is a higher strategic level, some of the most bitter arguments of the whole war particularly between Britain and the US as, as major allies, but also we haven't really talked about the Soviet Union, and I don't claim to be a Soviet specialist, but they've, all, they've got clear views about the Mediterranean as well. And that the British view is, is all about Mediterranean first, you know, this cliched idea of soft underbelly, um, but this idea of strike through the Mediterranean, it's not just Churchill, the chiefs of staff as well like this idea, Alan Brook likes this idea. They're, they're very nervous about doing a major thing like Northwest Europe. They want a peripheral route that's all about playing to their strengths, tighten the blockade, get new bases for bombing in the, from Southern Italy to then bomb, you know, whether it's Germany or more or whether it's Ploesti or, or what have you. Um, you know, play to your strengths as a naval power incremental approach. And the American view, certainly of all the Joint Chiefs of Staff, there is, depending on who you read, a slight question mark over FDR. We're we'll going to that now. Um, but the, the American Joint Chiefs of Staff is the views are either, for some of them, Japan first, or particularly Northwest Europe first. The idea of a Mediterranean campaign is going to be the cause of huge arguments over 42, 43, and even still in, in 44. Um, and it's also going to link in the Soviet Union to the point that you get the what pre-war would have been utterly unthinkable, a situation where Roosevelt and Stalin are effectively teaming up at a high level conference to, to almost ridicule Churchill about this idea of a Mediterranean campaign. This is not trying to even fight the war. Um, the American concern at the highest level is the British are only interested in protecting their imperial interests, a lot of which are in Africa, the Middle East, or those are routes to their other imperial interests. 
Um, and that to them fighting the war is secondary, whereas a lot of the British perspectives in this relationship are about one, rather unfairly, the Americans don't know what they're doing, uh, but also two, we're playing to our strengths. We have a logical approach, we have a reason why we're doing this. I always I often think one of the reasons why the debates get so fierce over the Mediterranean strategy is that kind of both sides of, of that, that argument are right, because there's a very, very clear reason why so many on the American side want to go for Northwest Europe. They want to leverage their strength, massive industrial power. They want to win the war as quickly as possible, to which they see that as the best route, so that they can also deal with Japan because they're fighting on two fronts in a way that Britain is fighting in this different war. Whereas it's logical for Britain because you can play on the fact that you control the Mediterranean entrances and have historically, yeah. you can play on the fact that you have bases of strength, you can play on the fact that you need the Mediterranean to link to your broader empire and fight a conjoined war rather than these entirely separate wars where maybe your East of Suez colonies are doing something completely different. Um, so I, I think that fuels a lot of the arguments that we see take place. And even at the, the relationship between FDR and Churchill is very good inevitably there's a lot of friction there mm. and in fact if you incorporate a soviet perspective which is essentially this idea that anything in the mediterranean is practically a betrayal of the idea of a grand alliance yeah it becomes a very very heated argument and essentially over time you very very clearly see the us or us slash soviet side win out in, in that argument um which to some on, on the British side is a huge, a huge shock, but also a source of, I don't know, I, I guess you would call it something like melancholy or shame because it links in with these broader British ideas of not only if they've been in the war longer, but also linking back to broader kind of British history and they think that they should be the leading power in the relationship. Uh, I'm not gonna weigh in on who should be, but the, the, I think that's how they often see it. Um, so that is the, there's, there's a, a deterioration for some time at the highest level, I think, after Torch, of, of the relationship specifically over the Mediterranean argument at the highest level, whereas as Sam points out, in terms of operating, they get better, they, they get better over time, they realise rather than mesh together, fight separately but side by side is a much better choice. They integrate logistics chains, although even then that links into the question of who's at the top of the relationship. There's an old one now, there's a great book uh, by Kevin Smith off the top of my head, Conflict Over Convoys, where he basically says, after Torch, the Americans take control of who controls global logistics through the lens of shipping, which as you know, I'm, I'm sad yeah. as I am. You're big on shipping, shipping. yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a crucial question. So it was an interesting change in the power dynamics of the relationship at the top, I think. So I wonder if maybe, the strategic relationship goes downhill a bit after Torch, but maybe the operational level kind of relationship okay. goes up. Well, I want to seize on your point power dynamics there, because in summary, this is the change over period when the Commonwealth go from being the dominant power in, e in the ETO to, to, to gradually becoming the secondary power. And by the time we get to Germany in 1945, there were way more Americans in the field. And thanks, Kevin, for your contribution. But, you know, it is a, a, a power shift. But let's talk about Italy and Germany. Well, that's our next one. I'll bring Karine again now, because if we're talking power shifts, that, that's where it gets even bigger, because Italy start off in the early part of the desert campaign pretty much there on their own. Then the, the, the Rommel and the Africa Corps arrive and they, they're kind of, Italy are the stronger partner, Rommel is the kind of secondary partner, and then gradually they lose their footing more and more and more, and, and their army, you know, despite the fact Trevor Sheehan told us yesterday, they are, the, the Italian forces fight incredibly uh, courageously in the Tunisian campaign. By the end of it, they're in a very different situation how they arrived there. So, Kareen, you know, you've written a lot about you know, fascism and Italy and what's going on. How does Italy come out of the Tunisian campaign and, and, and you know, as as a military, as a society, as an, as as Mussolini su sum it up again. I know you're going to say you're going to start with the quantify, but it's complicated. But kind of run us through where Italy is in this campaign, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. So um, I mean, going right back to to 1940, of course, initially the the whole Mediterranean region Hitler, um, to the Italians because you know this this region wasn't really. Uh, you know, a primary area of interest to the Germans for 
for ideological reasons and all sorts of other reasons. So, so the, the Germans hadn't really wanted to get in, in, um, involved in it. Um, uh, part of the, the armistice terms with France was that um, Italian, uh, the Italians would be stationed in North Africa, in the French um, colonies in North Africa under the uh, terms of the armistice, and they would look after things and maintain. But of course, as you say, you know, um, over the course of 1940, 1941, um, this relationship starts to change and it becomes clear really as early as, as January 1941, actually, that to, to Hitler, that actually the, the, the area of the Mediterranean and Africa more generally can't be left to the Italians alone, that they don't have the military strength to be able to defend it adequately against um, a potential threat from 41 onwards, uh, early 1941 onwards, the Germans are starting to send their representatives um, to the armistice co commissions in Africa, in West Africa, in North Africa. So you have these joint commissions already. So you, you're already beginning to see that shift. Um, and then that aggravates um, over the course of late 1941, early 1942, when, when the Italians are really struggling um, in the fighting in Libya. But when Operation Torch happens, um, there'd been for quite some time, actually, some real... Because the, the relationship between the, the Germans uh, and the French, uh, the Vichy French, had been getting better. The Vichy French had been engaged in close collaboration. And it got to a point where the Italians were starting to be really suspicious that, that, that Vichy was going to take Italy's place as Germany's, you know, next ally, its, its primary kind of ally. And, and so there are, there are a number of warnings um, that are coming through saying, you know, don't trust both Germans as well, because they're, they're plotting against us. Um, but of course, when it comes to it, the, the Germans do put on a, a united front to support the Italians, as we've already heard, you know, they, they send um, huge amounts of resources, you know, even though they're, they're really um, still having to fight in the East and devote a lot of manpower resources um, in the, the combat against the Soviet forces in the East. But they do send uh, a lot to Tunisia and that really, um, you know that's that's one of the key you know reasons that of course that the allies don't manage to to advance as quickly as they they mm. had hoped to um so yeah by the time that torch happens you you've got this real sort of suspicion between the italians and the germans but when piano Valle is summoned to to munich um you know the the the, the morning after um the the, the you know all this happens and they, they've discovered the, the torch landings. He's kind of expecting to meet solely with the Germans and he's he's hoping that he will be able to split them, um, divide them. But of course, the of it, um, you know, the, Laval at one point says to um, the Italians, you know, you know, it wasn't you who defeated us, it was the Germans. Um, he tells, you know, he says to the, the Italians to, you know, they have no real part in any of this, but they, you know, they, they do put on a united front. But behind all of that, there are growing tensions. And I think, you know, by the time the the Tunisia campaign is over, of course, this really has had a, a quite material impact on Italian strength. And you know, quite apart from the the military um, defeat for Italy, it's also a real political blow because Tunisia was so important to them ideologically you know it was an area that the Italian fascists had really coveted as part of this this ambition of you know this new um, Roman Empire and Tunisia was supposed to be critical to that so they've lost Tunisia they've lost Libya of course as well so all of this is crumbling apart and and this is when Mussolini's leadership as well really starts to come under pressure as well so you know this is really uh, you know, as has as been said before, the, the beginning of the end, really, for, for, for the Italian. Yeah, 
Thank you, Karine. I think what and I bring yeah, Richard. Yes, so you in, see that in that relation to Germans and the Italians. Yep. So, I, I th sorry, that's brilliant. I want to bring Richard and and Sam and Kevin in, but Richard, you're particularly big on the you know, the, the logistics and the in your military assessment of of, of Italy and the Tunisian campaign. Kind of give us a rundown of how just how broken they are, really. You're muted. Yeah. At the moment. Yeah. Um, well, so. The first thing I'd say is um, the Tunisian came, campaign, of course, is one part of their wider war. They committed to um, fighting in the Soviet Union. They sent the Eighth Army there, so um, which suffers extremely badly. So they simultaneously have that around the time of the, the Tunisian campaign. They also, by late 1942, the strategic bombing of Italy starts to properly begin it hasn't really happened before that partly over difficulties of actually doing it partly over concerns about reprisals and all sorts of things but that starts late 1942 heavy bombing of parts of italy starts to happen um italy has always struggled for access to key resources like oil coal um certain key metal ores and things like this and they've run down a lot of their stocks because they haven't been able to import them after declaring war they lose quite a few of their import routes and they have to rely more on germany who kind of want that stuff for themselves so um they're extremely suffer extremely badly um in this sense the total surrender number at um in tunisia is, is over 250,000 off the top of my head i can't remember i think there are slightly conflicting figures and a good proportion the majority of them are italian there's a good number of germans as well um but it also includes a lot of their best equipment all sorts of things like this so the, the italian armed forces are in very bad shape there's also broader questions about italy's war um so things like historians who've looked into reports from the um the, the ovra but basically the, the italian kind of secret police have um looked into this and sort of they, they find around this period that there's increasing anti-war sentiment um even though there are obvious problems with expressing that in fascist italy um later you're going to get riots or strikes or refusal to work in places like Turin, uh where some of the key industries are places like the fiat strikes famous set of strikes um incredible to think in a wartime dictatorship um Mussolini, as um, Karin sort of points out, it's it's very, very damaging to Italy's prestige. Loss of Tunisia, because it's a long-term Italian goal, has been for some time. But the loss of Libya is the end of the Italian empire in yeah. Africa. Um, so that's hugely damaging in terms of prestige. So in December 1942, Mussolini appears in public for the first time in some time, looks visibly unwell, um, which doesn't help when... To some extent, a kind of personality cult around the leader is an important part of fascist Italy's way of operating. Um, so things are very much on the decline. And in terms of relationships, can I talk briefly about the relationship with Germany? Please do. Yeah, yeah. It's massively on the decline. Um, it, it was arguably never that good. Um, they're kind of... All allies are allies for a reason. They're not in it out of some kind of spirit of, of friendship. Um, but there hadn't necessarily been that many longer term plans for an Italian German alliance prior to 1935. Um, in fact, in 19, as late as 1935, Britain and France are looking to get Italy on board as an ally as part of the Strasse Front to, to constrain Germany. Um, a lot of the wartime relationship at the highest level, lower down, there are some good examples of, of cooperation. But at the highest level, it's marked by a lot of distrust. Mm. Um, Germany invades Poland kind of without really telling the Italians. The Italians invade Greece without telling the Germans. Um, both sides invade the Soviet Union without telling the other. Um, the relationship is badly on the decline even before Torch. Yeah. Um, and it gets worse. There are a lot of German suspicions when things are going badly and they find a lot of their I don't know, convoys are being found and sunk and this kind of stuff. Rather than think about could there be an issue with, say, communications intelligence, and is it secure enough, which is the main issue? They blame the Italians because they think there are traitors in the Italian ranks mm. giving away secrets, which there isn't really any evidence of, certainly not at high levels. Um, 
And that distrust is really continuing to the point that by the time of the Tunisian campaign, some of the first Italian peace feelers are being quietly made through the Vatican to Myron Taylor, the American ambassador there. And on the German side, by the very late stage of the Tunisian campaign, I think the first German move, units move into Italy and move down to around Rome, right around the time Tunis falls, if off the top of my head. Um, now that's partly because they're expecting to fight there, but it's also they're preparing themselves for if Italy drops out the war and they're going to swoop. And that's exactly what happens in September. So the relationship was, was never that great. And the relationship is getting much worse. Um, so for all the frictions on the Allied side, it's nothing compared to what is happening uh, on the Axis side. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely worth making that point there. So I'm just going to bring briefly bring Sam in on this this same question. And Kevin, I'm going to save you to talk about the impact on the wider world because I want to bring in because you know the US are heavily involved and committed in the Pacific campaign over a massive area by this point. So how and if Torch and, and Tunisia affects that and the wider war. But just before we move on, I'll put the question back up on the screen. There. So Sam, anything you want to just add about the relationship between the Axis powers at the end of it? And this, you know, Tunisia is your, is your baby. So any any comments from you? Yeah, so there's just a couple. Is that um, it, I, I did see in the chat that there was a comment on what did it have effect did it have on Germany's relationship with Japan? And actually, I did find some. I believe it was ultra intercepted decrypts from the Japanese ambassador, uh, and he was um, not optimistic. Is the uh, term I would use um, because this was just around um, I think about. Uh, February, March time, around the point at which uh, Von Arnim is shouting back to um, Ob Sud, "Where are my supplies?" Um, and leads to quite an infamous um, rejoinder, where he's told that he needs to stop looking over his shoulder to Sicily, and he replies that he's squinting over his shoulder for supply ships. <laughs> um, and really, th the Axis high the Axis command in terms of relations not in terms of relationships between polities but purely in terms of prosecuting a campaign is disastrously riddled with infighting. There's mm. infighting between OMB Sud and Commando Supremo, there's infighting between um the Luftwaffe and the here there's infighting between the Italians and the Germans there's infighting between the German commanders on the ground Rommel hates von Arnim von Arnim <laughs> despises Rommel yeah. Messe is in there somewhere trying to make his voice heard um and one of the most staggering things in um in Tunisia is that even though North Africa has been ostensibly Italy's baby um, with yeah. Germany providing support, even if in reality that's not the case, um, in Tunisia that pretense is just go is is, is dying. It's it's fading away at an increased pace. Um, and one of the most um, interesting things is that as it, it, in the sort of same way that the as it did for the fascist state uh, in in germany and in italy as it grew in complexity the axis effort actually becomes more dysfunctional right. because the first month in tunisia is probably the most decisive directed and motivated month that the axis have and it's basically germany uh, troops flooding into tunisia and getting their strategic priorities set whereas Later on, you see at Kasserine, for instance, um, Rommel asks for all three of the available Panzer divisions and the Tiger battalions to be used against the Americans. Uh, von Arnim holds on to them for as long as possible. And this means that there's no concentration of force. And it means that the 21st and the 10th Panzer division, for instance, get dissipated against Allied defenses, which some are scratch built and can be knocked over by a strong breeze. Um, and it blunts the Kasserine attack just when the Axis need a decisive win. Um, and this is it, it is continuous throughout the campaign. You have um, one of the more infamous incidents is this first Italian army, the former Africa Corps, is retreating up the coast. They are trying to decide where to make their stand, where to stand, you know, Wadi Akara and Fideville, um, the Gabe's Gap. 
and what what you're getting is uh, I believe it's Vittorio Ambrosio and um, Kesselring. So your two senior commanders who aren't on the ground, they're both back in Italy, are issuing contradictory orders and telling them where they can mm. and can't go. And troops are being shuttled back and forth, wasting petrol, wasting time. And it just undermines the entire Axis defense effort. Effectively, by um, the last couple of months in Tunisia, what you're watching is small formations fighting a campaign um, in their localities. The, it, there's no joined up strategy whatsoever and in fact one of the big issues that that i didn't realize until i delved a bit deeper is that the axis actually have virtually no core commands so they have scratch built divisions that are made up of mixes of battalions and then they have no core command above them and there's only the army command so you have this this um dysfunction in terms of unit coordination mm. and then you have the mess that is their relationship and it, it just makes the axis effort entirely self-defeating after a certain point in the campaign well that's brilliant stuff and so i'm going to have to bring kevin in now because casserine came up and, and well, before i actually bring in the wider war kevin i mean for the for british we've we've been dissecting operation market garden for the last 79 years and we'll continue to keep on dissecting market garden for another few generations it's fair to say i've crossed your side upon you've been dissecting casserine and el guitar and that and that area for a long long time as well but the point sam makes about how um debilitating how damaging that was to the german german um side of things the italian relationship is that something that you Amer you americans kind of in your own self-examination maybe have failed to kind of pick up what's happening to the german uh, uh army at this point um you know the german uh army we don't see weakness there uh in north africa we just see strength because we have nothing to measure it against uh we go in with so much chip on our shoulder. We know what we're doing. We've got this great equipment that we just need to use. The American army is mechanized. It's modern. And, you know, we're prepared for war. And at Kazarine, you know, our light tanks are firing on German medium tanks. And a lot of guys forgot to replace uh, the, the paint round with live ammo. And so, you know, they're, they're firing these German tanks and realizing there's paint splotches on them. And the Germans, the German tanks are so superior, they're not firing back. They're running over the American light tanks. So it's a, a perfect example of just where the American army is, where the German army is uh, tactically in the war. So, and it's, it's just not a good showing by the Americans. Um, I'd say one of the big lessons out of Kazarin, because it equally, it, it really, the majority of the German attack hits the first armored division. Yeah. And the Americans, when they were creating their armored divisions, you know, the British were probably the most active in World War I's using armor. Uh, the Germans kind of took the ball and ran with it. The Americans are like, okay, how are we going to do our divisions? What are we going to base them on? How are we going to do this? Because we'd only had, you know, basically a battalion of tanks in World War I. And so what we do is we go with the idea of modeling it after the cavalry. And so instead of horses, we're going to have tanks. And this is going to be the legacy. And it's a disaster. And, and Kazarine proves it. You know, just heavy artillery, uh, German artillery is going to knock out tanks. Infantry units are going to exploit gaps. And so what the Americans have to do is go back to the planning board and say, okay, this idea of these kind of square divisions with like two big tank battalions you know, that's not going to work. We need to do a sort of a dis, we need to proportion infantry, armor, and artillery together within an armored division. And that's what you get that triangular division that mm. you see that is so successful on the continent of Europe. Um, and so, yeah, there are great lessons to be learned. Uh, and, and just there's mistakes up and down the board, and there's a clearing out sort of, well, throughout the North African campaign, uh, we can't just focus on, on, on Kazarine. Uh, the sting of battle is a real test for who can lead and who can't. So you you lose the 3rd Infantry Division, a guy named Anderson, I don't think anybody's ever heard of, <laughs> and they promote the, the, the Deputy Commander, Assistant Division Commander, Truscott, who becomes one of the great leaders uh, on the yeah. American side in the war. I think, you know, Kevin, kind of simplifying what you're saying is that, is that the, you, the U.S. in Tunisia, and we'll bring, bring the others in as well, is 
you 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 don't really care about how the the axis wage war it's about you imposing your way of waging war on them you're big enough to to bring and influence things and you could make the point that earlier the Commonwealth have been reacting a little bit more to what the Axis are doing and haven't been able to play their own game yet. But you, you kind of encourage us. And then by the time we get to the invasion of Italy and the Second Front in Normandy, we're trying to basically, the Allies, get the Axis to respond to what we're doing. We're dictating the, the rules of play. We're attacking. They, they've got to respond. So you, we're all kind of coming out of it. But we are into the question now, folks, uh, about the uh, the the impact of the of the conclusion of the North American campaign on the wider war. And there have been every time I've done one of these shows in this series, some people have said in the sidebar, we shouldn't have bothered with North Africa at all. Why do we even go there? It was all a sideshow, um, and that's been a recurring theme from. So I think some people have been saying it just to kind of to get a reaction, just to kind of say that statement there. But it is definitely a thing. You do read that. You see it in internet articles. You see it and things. People say, why do we bother go there at all? So so let's go. Let's jump around. Who wants to start us off with what impact did the conclusion of the North African campaign have on the wider war? Who haven't we? Richard, Sam, do you want to go back to you, Sam? Let's bring Sam in this time. Start with Sam. Yeah, sure. So, uh, well, the... I think uh, I want to build on, on Kevin's point a bit because the Americans building their, and the Allies building their way of war, I've mentioned about the structures of how they fight, but also one of the things that the, the Allies get to do in Tunisia and something that I think eludes the casual observer because Tunisia, it's part of North Africa, right? And therefore the North African literally you think of the Western Desert. Yep. Tunisia is climatically similar to a lot of Southern Europe more than it is to the Western Desert. Yep. And what the Allies get to do there is they get to go, well, our system of war, how do we actually prosecute it when we get back to Europe? Good um, point. And so one of the things that that um, Allied units particularly find difficult um, once they've wrested the initiative from the Axis and get to do it, get to go on the offensive, is how do you displace the German defensive system? Um, because the German defensive system is a lot of very lightly held outposts that then fall. It's the elastic defense. It, it's lightly held outposts that fall back. And then once you've overconfidently overextended, they hammer you on the counterattack. You're driven back. You lose all your gains. Um, and the allies have to figure out how do we do that while climbing a, you know, a thousand feet? Um, you know, how do we get up to the top of Longstop Hill or Green Hill or or Takrauna, um, and get the get the access to to seed territory to us so that we can actually advance. Um, and one of the things that the Allies very much start to understand is how to deploy their materiel to achieve tactical effect. And okay. it's that wedding of tactics to understanding how you're going to shuffle things off the top of a mountain so for the americans and the british it's both lob a load of artillery at it and then have some sophisticated infantry tactics to follow that up but if you drown the the germans in shells and bombs uh, and you've got enough tanks to follow it up you can move them off a position and um you know uh, Kevin, you may have read about 34th Infantry Division. They retraining for the strike towards Tunis at the end of the campaign. They are marching behind creeping barrages led by their divisional commander. That's how they train for this, this final strike. They go, what have we missed? It's getting into the German positions. So we need to shell the enemy positions to hell and back and get in there within a minute of the of the barrage lifting because that they'd found to be the big weakness on their in their mm. offensive strategy and then they prosecute it in in the valley um i can't remember what the in the the valley's called um as they advance towards Berserta, but they shift um manteuffel's division um, back again and again and again and again, and they improvise new different tactics to do that. And this is one of the things I, I, I um, call uh, Tunisia the Allied Sandbox, mm. because it's it's the kindergarten where they go and play around for a bit, and they 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 build things up and they kick them over when they don't work, um, and then they can take that that to the big boys' playground later in Europe. Mm. That's a good point, and 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 we've one of the things we've come up is that is that. 
the multiple types of terrain then can to Tunisia. Yeah, the, the, it, it would be false to say the Western Desert is just flat desert because there are variations of desert. But Tunisia has everything from massive great hills to to valleys to green areas to 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 the water the wadis full of water and so, all sorts of things having to overcome. As you say, it's a it's like a, a a theme park of different terrains to have to feel feel through that will help them later in Italy, will help them later in Normandy and elsewhere. And yeah, but uh, that's a, a bit a big uh, response there about the kind of military learning curve but the, the effect on the war or the wider one i've been carrying in and we'll, 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 maybe i'm conscious of time here not that we have a, a time limit but I, I i'm aware we've been at it for 75 minutes geopolitically is there anything else that the torch campaign has an impact in the wider world that we've overlooked saying so far kareen you know you, you're particularly strong on italy and france is there anything else that we've, we've, we've we should mention about the impact of the tunisia campaign globally so kareen that's for you well, I guess a, a, a couple of um, points to mention, perhaps fairly obvious point. Um, firstly, of course, you know, that um, this, as, as a consequence of the, of the campaign and the um, the Tunisia campaign and the, the eventual victory in, over Tunisia, this, of course, does, you know, bring about the decision that the next step is going to be in Italy. And, of course, a few months later, you get Operation Husky, and yeah. that, of course, also has an impact on the decisions about the the landings in France, in northern France. That's that, of course, the the occupation of France as well. Um, and also, just so uh, just so I wanted to mention as well, um, in terms of the Soviet Union, um, you know, going back to what we we're saying earlier, I mean, the Soviets, of course, are watching all of this and. Going back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of the, the deal with Dahlon, that goes down also badly in the Soviet Union because they are thinking, well, if they they make if the British and Americans are making a deal with a collaborator, what's going to happen with the Germans and the Italians? And that, of course, leads to the announcement of this policy of unconditional surrender. So, mm. so it does have these kind of wider knock-on effects um, for, for the wider war in, in that sense. Thank you very much. So, um, Kevin, let's bring it back to you because we've got to bring in the we've got to bring in the Pacific. I mean, the U.S. You know, you, you've you've got this Germany first policy, um, and, and and you know, Midway and things like that in '42 have allowed you to kind of not relax in the Pacific, but you've you've had your first kind of major victory, the Guadalcanal. But but how? What does Torch and Tunisia have? On the rest of the war, how are the chiefs of staffs? How are Marshall? Are they, are, are they kind of breathing a sigh of relief? Does it does it pile more pressure on because it now brings about the the the, 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 the second front is now looming large? Give us an assessment of how how it affects U.S. policy kind of globally and, and where the U.S. are at the end of this. Sure, um, I can't say that uh, that um, George C. Marshall is super happy. I mean, he's glad that the American army has kind of proved itself. Um, it, it can't run before it walks, and that's what it's doing. But he never wanted to go into North Africa. Remember, he mm. wanted to go into France in 1942. And to see what happens in, in North Africa, I think it's a big lesson for him that the American army is not ready yet, and it's not, not the finished product. Yet. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, there were certain things, too, like the, the question of uh, what is the bigger strategic picture, like, what if we had never gone to North Africa? What if we had subdued it through our Navy and, and bombing, you know, aerial campaign? And I just think that's so short-sighted because how are you going to tell this to Stalin? Like, hey, we think we can do this stuff without taking heavy casualties, where he's taking massive casualties yeah, on a daily point. basis. You need to show, Roosevelt needs to show, hey, we're in this thing to win. We're, we're willing to make the sacrifices that you guys are, you know. If you don't have North Africa, you're not going to have the invasion of southern France because those ports in North Africa are going to be what supplies them. Yep. You know, you're 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 creating a much more stable area for communications around the Mediterranean and you're giving us another supply line to the Soviet Union. So there's a, a great deal of strategic advantages uh, to the to the North African campaign. You know, and I hate to like just say, you know, I, I, I understand the playground concept. But it really is necessary for the U.S. Army to learn what works and what doesn't. Um, and, and, I, and I think when people think of the American Army in World War II, it's this very powerful mechanized force. 
remember, we're not strong enough to have an army uh, in North Africa. The best we can do is a core, you know, a, a group of divisions. And, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I've read these cases where Patton shows up and a lot of the Americans are wearing British jackets or armed with British rifles. You know, um, the American army, it, it's got to pull away from this sort of apprenticeship under the British and become its own self. Mm. Um, and that's not possible without the North African campaign. No, definitely. I think it's been a recurring theme these couple of weeks is that there's there was an element of not under preparation for torch, but there definitely wasn't the 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 plan B, C, D, E that you get later on and later where, where they've absolutely kind of got these insurance policies in yeah there's the, the the when we talked about the landings at Casablanca they didn't know about the coral there and 60 percent of the landing craft were, were, were destroyed there these are the kind of things that routinely as the war goes on they're theoretically trying to get those that information in place there there's a lot of there were there were obviously problems in the Tunisian campaign but there was a lot of things where we kind of got away with things by that, that maybe could have come back and haunted us worse. And we kind of realized, okay, we, we got away with that by the skin of our teeth. And I think this is now when to bring up, bring perhaps Richard in about the, 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 the wider implications there, both as, as, as the allied armies developing their skill sets, but also on anything else you think we've, we, we haven't mentioned yet in the wider implications. I think this is the question you wanted to bring anyway. So Richard, to you, wider implications globally. I don't think we've talked too much about, and again, maybe because it's so obvious, but the, the reopening of the Mediterranean that comes after no, the end yet, no. of the Tunisian campaign. Um, it's still dangerous going through the Mediterranean after Tunisia falls because there's still air bases, there's still some submarines. Um, but the reopening of the three route from Gibraltar through Suez, which cuts about, let's say, if you use India as an example, about 40% off the the time it takes to sail to India rather than going all the way south of the Cape of Africa. Um, that's a huge saving in yeah. shipping time, which is a really dull thing to talk about in some ways. But what's what are two things that underpin the Allied war, particularly from 41, 42 onwards? A resource advantage and the ability to kind of leverage it over your allies and global mobility to, to yeah. move command of the seas or at least superiority at sea and the ability to move things around and bring those superior resources especially after america and the war with their incredible industrial potential that's crucial but also even in terms of conducting the war certainly for the western allies any war is going to be amphibious beyond your use of air and sea power for other things you need shipping to do it you need shipping to move your things around and even the massive maritime powers of Britain and America combined, even they have draws on their, their massive stock of shipping. So this saving in time might seem dull, but it's hugely impactful. Because if your whole war is, is built around shifting things around globally, so you know for the I know you're I know you're in Normandy, Woody, the, the ability to invade, of course, is only because they can shift a load of stuff yeah, yeah. Over, uh, over the over the Atlantic. The, the opening of the Mediterranean causes a massive longer term save of shipping that allows them to do that. And simultaneously on the other side, because all actions have a reaction, it's cutting off access mobility in general and yeah. worsening their own position in terms of resources and industrial potential because they're getting blockaded more and more closely they're getting bombed more and more because the bases are closer um so it, it's just another turn of the screw in terms of that disparity mm. um so that's kind of the, a really crucial thing I, I think rather than picking one theater where the war is won or lost it's a it's a incremental process. Oh god it's an incremental process um and it, it kind of uh is something that, 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 that the, the opening of the Mediterranean really helps to, to kind of allow to happen. Yeah. Um, even for the Soviet Union, which of course is heavily land-based power, the ability to, to ship stuff to them through the Arctic and, and things like this. So it's, it's a crucial ability to do that. I tend to, I think of the war as particularly from late 1941 onwards, one side is a global coalition, right. one side is almost three regional powers kind of fighting to some extent in a loose kind of coalition yeah. together. Um, and so as long as you can play on that advantage, 
what, what else can the access powers do? Even in, fair enough to say there's lots of problems at Kasserine and things like that for the, for the Americans, but what's the advantage to fighting longer in Tunisia for the Axis powers? What's the advantage of sending more of your limited forces and resources to Tunisia to fight beyond maybe buying a bit of time before you get invaded, but then you won't have those forces when you do get invaded? Yeah, so, I mean, that's been the question we've had every, every show is why did the Germans bother reinforcing? I and mean, then there's hubris, there's Hitler, there's there's lots of reasons to explain it, but we, I don't necessarily go down that rabbit hole. But I want to bring Sam in before we bring our last question up, because I'm, again, conscious of time, is that would it be fair to say, Sam, that over the course of the, the, to the torch, to, to, the, to Tunis campaign, there's a gradual improving of, I'm going to use the word efficiency of things. I mean, we're looking for these big things because, ah, oh, we learned how to do this, this big kind of thing you can hold up and say, this is what we didn't do well, and now we're doing it well. But I think, is it more of an incremental change? You know, we've got, it's fine margins. You know, the difference between a, fi a football team winning a, a football match and losing, can, it can be a little bit of, little bit of fitness, a little bit of a tactical nous. And is it, is it something that you're seeing across the, the as your study of Tunis is that we're gradually just improving all our margins in all areas, logistics, how to move things around, air interdiction, ground support. Is, is that fair to say? I think by the end of the campaign, that's what, you, what you'd say. At the start of the campaign, and this is the, one of the crucial things to note, Torch is exceptional compared to everything that has come before it. You've got to remember mm. that, that Dieppe, for example, is launched with a fraction the forces at a fraction the distance. Um, the Allies are committing you know, 100,000 troops similar like numbers of tonnage and supplies yeah. uh, in the first wave like 600 ships it is a, a frankly ludicrous investment and operation torch i'm sure by when you've had uh, vince o'hara on he's probably mentioned it. it the the allies learned so much about the one thing and um richard said it earlier the amphibious landings are a fact of life um, they've been a fact of life of British warfare for centuries, but in Second World War, amphibious invasions have to be a fact of life for the Allies. And what they learn in Torch is staggering. Like they test all of their landing ship concepts. They they figure out how to do combat loading because they don't do combat loading during Torch, and that makes an absolute mess. Mm. Um, and then, as the conflict wears on, they get into more traditional operational territory and that's where the gradual improvement comes um in terms of leveraging their supply power and again building on what richard's just said about opening the mediterranean um the allies are getting that global coalition massive deluge of material down um want the, they have dozens of ports um operating along the tunisian coast by the end well along the north african coast by the end of the campaign but just to put it in context i think it's february 43 um uh, no, it's December to January. Um, so December 42 is January 43. The Port of Bone brings in 120,000, 127,000 tons of supplies. Wow. That is more than the entire Axis effort in Tunisia for those two months. The Allies are figuring out how to do logistics on a global scale. And the opening of the Mediterranean, um, I believe, it, I can't remember who uh, it was that I was reading, but quantified it as we saved about a million annual tons of shipping, which is, is ludicrous. It, it mm. boggles the mind. You can't envisage a million tons of shipping. Um, and this is added to the fact that you actually liberate a considerable portion of the French merchant fleet from North African ports as well, which for those who are interested in the conflict over convoys actually repays a lot of that torch debt to the allied shipping pool once they're refitted um so yeah this campaign is is watching the allies uh, i know that alamein is is the end of the beginning um by the point at which I, I would say husky is the point at which you start saying you know the beginning of the end because that's when they breach mm. fortress europe so Tunisia is that midpoint in which the Allies go, hang on, we can win this, and we mm. can win this convincingly. Um, 
and begin to show all of the necessary portions of, of you know, air, air control, logistics, operational technique, command structures that they need to actually go and, and crush the axis in Europe. Well, I mean, I was thinking we've got loads of rabbit holes we go down there. The, the air support and air cooperation is coming up in a sidebar where we could bring someone like Mike Bechtold or Ben Kite or someone in there. There's lots of lessons there. But I think we will just do our final question now. And I think maybe we would have time to question the viewers. We'll see. But um, and I think we'll just do one point each really on this. I'm going to kind of be strict now because I'm working on. So we've got are there any particular narratives concerning the Tunisia campaign that we want that we that you individually want to argue against or say every time I read a book about Tunisia, this is the thing that in there that infuriates me. It's something that we need to move away from, kind of a a, a myth busting, if you like, question there. So let's go back to Karine first. So something that we we are left with in the narrative about the Tunisian campaign that annoys you, that grinds your gears, that, that we want to argue against, something that you just want to want to get off your chest. Now the time. This is like a free counselling session of everybody here. So um, something in the narrative that we need to move on from or, or, or readdress, Karine. Well, there's perhaps not something that's, that's, you know, particularly sort of, um, you know, that is necessarily a kind of feature of... of um, the narratives, but I just wanted to raise the point that it wasn't actually inevitable that um, that Vichy was going to side with the Axis mm. over Tunisia, because actually, if you go back to um, January 1942, um, General Juin had issued orders um, to the French commanders in North Africa um, to defend against the Axis. Um, so had it been the Axis, I mean, this is one of those kind of hypothetical questions, had it been the Axis that had gone in rather than the Allies first, um, you know, would Vichy have, have defended against the Axis? Um, well, that the, those were the orders. Um, and a couple of months later, I mean, uh, Admiral Darlan didn't know about these orders. And he, when he discovered them, he ordered, he instructed that these orders must be destroyed in case the Germans and, and the Italians found out, but he never actually repudiated them. So it does kind of raise one of these intriguing questions about, you know, had this actually happened, had it been the Axis that had gone in first before the Allies, um, you know, perhaps Vichy would have, um, you know, defended against the Axis. Um, so, so, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that. OK, thank you very much. And I think we should have you back on at some point, Karine, because you know, living in France, as I do, I'm seeing this gradual shift of how France is confronting its 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 past. And it's going through these various phases. And the historiography of that is really fascinating. And I, you know, I, I'm going down a slight rabbit hole, for, folks, apologies. But I was in Paris recently. The Musée de la Libération there is really changed how it talks about Pétain in 1940 with its new exhibition halls to compare how it was saying 10 years ago so so and that's and that's 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 continental france the, the the french colonies i think there's still room for more examination of what they wanted before the war where they were going i think i'd have to have you back one day and we'll we'll talk about the the, the where we are in us as the as as english-speaking countries understanding france's war and where france is itself and indeed, where Italy is itself in understanding its war, because I think we're possibly further ahead in understanding our war than, than, than perhaps these countries are. But uh, we'll go back to this idea of things you want to argue against. So, Kevin, I, I, you're, you're bound to mention Cat Patton. You're allowed to mention Patton. You have written about it. But what's the one thing about the Tunisian campaign that you think we need to readdress or reevaluate or, or, or argue against? Sure. The, so there's five things. No, I'm kidding. I'll keep it to one. Um no, I, I would say the biggest one, and I hate to badmouth my guy, but it's that Patton won the Battle of El Guitar. Um, it was not his battle to win. It was Terry Allen, the commander of the 1st yeah. Infantry Division. Terry Allen fought a brilliant defensive strategy. Uh, he was doing it ad hoc. Uh, he did not see the German attack coming. Patton gave him, supplied him with everything he could. Uh, he was not um, stingy about artillery or artillery units. But Terry Allen won the Battle of El Guitar and deserves all the credit. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, let's go to Richard next, and we'll finish with Sam because people people are loving what you're saying. Sam, they're loving what you're all saying, but Sam is getting some real hero worship in the sidebar. So let's go to Richard first. What's the thing that you go? We need to address that again. So Tunisian campaign. There you are. You're one thing. Um, for me, for some time, people have often presented torch and then the subsequent Tunisian campaign as this big turning point in the Mediterranean. Um, 
which essentially shifts it from either a position of rough kind of stalemate or perhaps even, depending on who you read, for some people, possibility of, of Axis victory, uh, through to one where it becomes an Allied victory in, in the theatre. Um, and my view has been for some time, it's not a turning point. You can argue it's an accelerant of something that's already happening. The Mediterranean is an attritional war, just as it is in many other parts of, of the globe. And one side is not able to keep up with the attrition that's taking place. Um, this doesn't necessarily always go down well with everyone as, as an argument. I will say I did another recent and hopefully something coming out on this soon, looking to the Axis source material. And they're, they're particularly from the Italian side who are doing all of the, the supplying of, of everything that's taking place. They're actively referring to it repeatedly as a war of attrition and their concerns get greater and greater as time goes on. And their concerns are already really big before Torch. So it, it's an important moment in the war in many ways, talked about learning, talked about the impact on logistics, power relationship and the Allied side and all these sorts of things. It's not a turning point in the course of the Mediterranean War in terms of who may or may not end up uh, on the victorious side, though, for me. Well, brilliant. And, uh, and, and that's something John Parshall echoed at the end of the El Alamein panel is that he, he has a problem with turning points generally. It's it's two, it's two, they're two definitive statements. It's, you know, Midway's a turning point, Stalingrad's a the turning point. It, they're all, they're all not happening in a vacuum. It's a, the, the war is being won and waged by, by multiple little things that all combine together. But turning points seem to be a convenient coat hook to pin things. That's when it all changed there. And that's, that's why we left them. But Sam, We'll, we'll bring you in last. I think, folks, we're not going to have time to be questions because we're going to be here all, all the time. And I want people to watch. I want people to watch this later on. If it gets too long, people will will, will skip it and watch something else. So I want to just we'll sum up with Sam. You know, you, this has been T Tunisia and the campaign. It's, it's, it's literally been your your baby for the last few years of this. So you've probably got a biggest the biggest argument in this. So what's the thing that we need to readdress? What's the the thing that you we need to fight against in terms of the narrative? I think that what we we need to be looking at with Tunisia um and Richard says you know said said it well when he said that Tunisia is not some turning point because it's not um we also need to not contextualize it as like the march to victory and this is very much a um a, a narrative that comes out of Montgomery um and Alexander to an extent we where the sort of once Alamein goes, there's the idea that we've shoved them off of the African continent and then we're shoving them up the Italian peninsula. And it's this this idea that, that there's just a, a gradually growing momentum. And it's not, it, a lot of it comes from Monty hero worship. Mm, and this, mm. this then boils down to, you know, who gets the credit for who, what won the Tunisian campaign. And in, in my opinion, it, it's the forces that come from the West that, that really decides Tunisia. Um, and even though Montgomery gets his share in the spotlight, he gets all the support in the world. I'm sure Kevin can can point to some of those instances where Alexander goes, Patton, could you go and distract the Germans for a minute while Monty breaks through here? Um, it is the forces under AFHQ that decide the course of Tunisia. Um, it's not some you know, wonderful jaunt across the North African littoral for Eighth Army, um, and we need to we need to eviscerate that uh, in the same way that, to to an extent, the the Patton hero worship, Patton's in command of Second Corps for less time than Bradley is, um, and we need to stop letting the big personalities dominate our understanding of some of these campaigns. No, that's a very good point. I think I, I kind of sum up this is that I think we still look at torch as a personality driven. Everyone uses it. Kevin's going to look guilty now. We use it as our examination of where Patton is in his command structure, where's Montgomery and, and other figures as well. And, and that's all very well and good and, and very interesting. But I think there's definitely more room for some serious studies of torch to Tunisia. And I, you know, in, in my prep for this series, you know, I, ha I had my various windows open and the, the amount of books there are about Operation Overlord, the amount of books there are about Market Garden, the amount of books about Midway. There isn't that much about Torch. You know, it, it has a, it, there, are, there are chapters on it in big sweeping books that tell us about, you know, the, the whole of World War II. But 
you know, there aren't that many. It just it has been overlooked. And it's far more than just a learning curve. It's far more than just a few armies getting you know, the allied armies getting their tactics a bit improved. It, there's so many things you brought in, Richard, the, the, you know, the, the shipping we've brought in, the, the, the personalities. Karine's brought in where, where how it affects France and Italy. And there's a lot more we could do with this. The fact that we haven't really addressed in total all the questions. There's there's many more threads we could have picked up on this. Is is that it's deserving of, of a wider study. I want you to all nod along here. I know Sam, you're working on a book and Richard, you'll be working. But I think we we you know the fact I checked on YouTube, there's nothing really on YouTube about torch, really. I mean, well, not the Tunisian campaign. There's a few things about torch, but there's there there really haven't been any contextual discussions where they're trying to take it through from beginning to end. So I think we've We've broken up a bit of broken a bit of ground here on World War Two TV. So I'm really proud of, of of what we've done of these these couple of weeks. And we've got Michael Nyberg on Thursday, uh, and that will bring it all to an end. So, um, uh, so folks, I've been mean, great. Thanks for your correspondence. Thanks for your comments in the sidebar. I wish we could address them all, but I want people to watch this. If we if we nudge towards two hours, people will look at it in a few days' time and go, "No, it's it's too much." I want if we keep if we stop it now, it's been great. So, um. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Karine. Thanks, everybody watching. I will see you all again on Thursday night or Thursday afternoon, depending on where you are, with Michael Nyberg. And we'll go right back to the beginning and talk about the, the, the American um, plans prior to Torch and how the politics, so politics affected that. So I'm really looking forward to speaking to Mike. So thanks, everybody. This is Paul Dad for World War II TV. I'll see you on Thursday. Cheers, everybody. Thanks to my panelists. Thanks, everybody. Bye. <laughs>